Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. I am Maggie Reardon and I am a senior reporter at CNET and I'll be moderating today's discussion and we're going to be talking about President Biden's massive infrastructure plan, which also includes uh, a great deal of money for broadband. And we have some really amazing guests here today to talk with us. Um, so uh, first we've got Keith Gabbard, who is CEO of the People's Rural Telephone Cooperative, Telephone Cooperative in Kentucky. Uh, Scott Walston, who is president and senior fellow of the Te Technology Policy Institute and Nicole Turner Lee, uh, a senior fellow in governance studies, um, the director of the Center for Technology Innovation and a co-editor in chief of Brookings Tech Tank blog. So um, before we get started here, I wanna make sure that I remind everybody in the audience um, to please submit questions. We're gonna have about 15 minutes here at the end where we're gonna go to questions and you can submit those at events at Brookings edu or via Twitter using the uh, hashtag digital divide. So um, let's kick it off. I guess my first question for you guys is um, what are your first impressions of of this big plan? It was kicked off in about March. We don't have a ton of details, but uh, let's start um, with you, Nicole. What was your first sort of impression or what's been your impression since it's been kicked off here? Well, thank you, Maggie, for um, hosting this, and, and I'm really excited to be on the panel with Scott and Keith as we discuss, I think, what has become one of the most prominent issues alongside several of the issues that our society is actually addressing. And this is good news, just I have to say, for those of us who have been doing this about 25 years, actually see this probably displayed as a discussion point. I mean, I gotta say this, I think I'm pretty excited about the fact that broadband infrastructure is actually being seen as a critical asset. I mean, it's been a long time since we've actually seen some type of consistency and proclamation that we need to do something to, you know, not just um, repair our water and bridges and water systems and bridges and other uh, critical infrastructure, but we've included broadband in a meaningful way. And it's unfortunate that the pandemic had to bring this to the forefront but while we have the momentum, I'm pretty excited that the infrastructure plan is including that. With that being said, and this is current conversations that are actually going on between the Democrats and Republicans, I hope they realize that it takes a lot of money to build a continuous network across the country. And the smaller and smaller that down payment becomes, it means that we're gonna have to find other resources to actually subsidize areas that may be unserved or underserved. And we may find ourselves pretty much in the same traps that we have been over the years, where we have not necessarily predicted out just how massive the situation is and how much it really requires a multi-stakeholder approach uh, between the public and private sector. So I would say, again, I'm excited about it, but I also see, I think, some opportunities to avoid spinning the same wheel. And I'll just end here, Maggie. I mean, clearly, there have been a lot of us that have been doing this for a long time. And we want to make sure that this plan doesn't become an infrastructure plan of post-it notes that we sort of uh, discuss individually. We're not having it strategically match with a broader plan that will have metrics and outcomes that we can say we've done a better job. Uh, some of you might know I've been putting out this idea of a Tech New Deal proposal primarily to push us to think more comprehensively around what this looks like when we look at deployment, adoption and utilization, as well as local investments in digital equity. So I, I just hope, Maggie, you know, this doesn't become sort of like the same conversation we had maybe when we talked about, you know, American recovery under Obama, where we put a lot of money out there, we put a lot of ideas, we have the political will, but yet we're still not solving the problem. And unfortunately, until we get down to what that looks like, and hopefully we'll talk about it today, the core essence of what the pandemic taught us, it's not just about being connected, it's about being poor and disconnected. It's about being rural and disconnected. Yeah. It's about being old and disconnected. So my hope is this infrastructure plan becomes more than just about infrastructure, but it really goes and taps into the people that are behind the infrastructure and who need to get access to be much more um, you know, contributors of our society. Yeah, Keith, what were your first impressions? Well, my first impression, well, first of all, thank you, Maggie, for for, for hosting this and, and for allowing me to be on. But my first impression was still a lot of unanswered questions and the details. Uh, certainly, uh, as a CEO of a broadband provider in a, in a rural, small rural area in eastern Kentucky, uh, we know a little bit about what it takes to provide broadband. And we, we actually were fortunate enough in two counties 
countywide here, uh, we, we've, we've provided fiber to the premise, to every home and premise, every home and business in both these counties. So we know it can be done and we know it's expensive. And, and the American Recovery Act was some of the funds we used to do that back, started back in 2008. So, so we know uh, how critical it is to our consumers and member owners as well. And, and it's just a very important topic. And I'm just happy that it's being discussed as, as Nicole said. So I think so far we've got Nicole who's saying, let's get the political will to do this. And you're saying, I want to know the details. Yes. <laughs> and Scott, what's your, what was your impression, first of all? Right. Well, I mean, I guess my very first impression was, um, I can't believe we're going to spend $100 billion based on two paragraphs. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, the, the, the bigger impression, though, is first, you know, what, what Nicole said, it's nice that we're actually paying attention to this problem um, outside of the you know, smallish telecom community. Um, because, I mean, this is an issue that lots of us have written and studied about for a long time. Uh, and now with the pandemic, everybody can see the problems of, of not being connected and knows what the costs can be. And so that's really nice to see that this has become sort of a mainstream thing. Um, a couple of things that I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about, though, one is that um, I'm concerned that we're going to fall into the same trap that we've been in for a long time with universal service spending, which is um, spending far more on rural areas, which are primarily white, um, and ignoring low-income communities, which uh, are, you know, are much less likely to be connected. Now, that's not to say there aren't problems in rural America, because we all know there are. Um, but uh, the, the balance has long been very strongly in favor of uh, of connecting in, in rural America. And we might ask how it is that we've already spent $100 billion there and it's still so terrible. So we need to, we need to address that. Um, the other thing that worries me is that so far, um, again, we, like Keith said, we don't know details and those will matter a lot. There isn't much or any emphasis of, on evaluation. Um, you know, how are we gonna know if this works? And this really needs to be built into the programs themselves uh, because looking at it ex ex post, looking at it after the fact, um, it's very hard to identify whether it's the subsidies that made a difference, whether we're continuing on a similar trend. Uh, and we really, we really want to know. It's, it's an opportunity to learn lots, um, uh, lots of things. And then, you know, one, I guess one final thought, uh, and I know we'll get into uh, art off later, but the idea of reverse auctions to distribute the funds is a good idea. Um, but it, the, it can also be, uh, the, the outcomes can also be affected by politics. And so um, Keith mentioned the, um, the BTOP, the program, the, um, the uh, President Obama's stimulus plan. And its effectiveness was, um, it was made less effective by having to uh, have at least, I forget what the exact rule is, but having to have at least one um, project in every state. And uh, so sometimes if there's only one or two proposals, you're, you know, it might be not very cost effective at all. And so, you know, we want to minimize the, the extent to which politics gets in the way of this. Yeah, yeah. So we all mentioned here, initially, this was coming out as being billed as a $100 billion um, program that, you know, I'm not sure where we got $100 billion. Because <laughs> I think a lot of people think this is what's likely to be the Obama or the Biden plan is going to be coming from um, the basis is from Representative Clyburn's bill that's now being talked about. And I think that was about $80 billion, if I'm not mistaken, right? So we tacked on an, another 20 billion, but then now the 100 billion is changing. It could be 65 billion um, if Republicans sort of get their wishes. So, uh, and we can talk a little bit about the money here, but one of the the aspects of the plan that I thought was interesting, one of the details we got, is this idea of investing in future-proof networks. And I think a lot of people took that to mean fiber. And I'm just curious what you all feel about that. You know, this, again, whether it's 65 billion, 80 billion, 100 billion, it does seem like a lot of money. Um, and a lot of it is gonna be going toward uh, some sort of infrastructure. So is, uh, is fiber the way to go? Is is it okay for the government to be uh, directing money toward um, specific types of technology uh, for their funds? So I don't know, Keith, do you wanna kick off with that? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, of course, I will say I'm a little biased because we have built fiber to the home everywhere throughout our service area. So I'm definitely a strong proponent of fiber. Fiber is the best technology, is the best way to, to 
to, to send the technology out right now. I think as much fiber as we can possibly get is the way to go. Now, we're also, along with four other small companies in East Kentucky, owners of a regional wireless company. So I'm very familiar with the Segar, the wireless business, how that works as well. But, I mean, fiber is as future-proof as you're going to get. And, and you, we've just seen some major... Uh, major differences in quality of life here where we've built fiber and, and almost every it, county that's realistic. I mean, do we think that, I don't know. Um, I don't know, Scott, do you want to take that one? Like, is it realistic to have fiber everywhere? Um, sure. Well, first I, I don't like the phrase future proof um, because it's meaningless. Um, <laughs> what we, what we really want to do is minimize our, our you know, the net present value of total expenses subject to you know, whatever level of service we think is appropriate for every time. Now, just because we think we're, we might need whatever, you make, make up a number, two gigs in 10 years, doesn't mean that you should pay for two gigs right now. Um, it just doesn't make any sense because paying more, you know, paying for some of it later will make a lot, will may make a lot more sense. And that's the context in which we should be thinking about it. Um, and I, I think Keith uh, is right. Fiber is fiber is great, obviously. And so I don't want to criticize anybody who's laying fiber because that's awesome. Um, but it is code for fiber. Uh, and um, I think the, the right way to think about it is sort of really along the lines that the FCC has been doing it now for oh, under several administrations, a couple of administrations. Um, which is kind of trying to figure out what are what what the relative weights are um, of how much people value different types of service, um, and making awards based on on that. Um, we can talk more about that later, but, but I think that's a great way to approach yeah, it. Yeah, I was just going to say though, but isn't the idea of um, future proofing? I, I think it's this the sense I'm getting with that that statement is also a frustration that the FCC, in particular, has spent billions and billions of dollars over many years, um, you know, providing subsidies for companies to build networks that then they have to go back in those same areas and build networks again. And that seems like that's problematic. And I don't know, Nicole, if you want to sort of chime in on that. I mean, so is it, um, I mean, that seems to me what they're trying to get at here with like, let's build it once and get the infrastructure, like the roads where they need to be, and then we can put the service on top of it and get people to, to subscribe. Yeah, I mean, I think to both Keith's point as well as Scott's, I mean, I think we need to be a little bit careful when we talk about future-proofing to one standard. Now, I think it's really important that whatever we do is technology agnostic. I can tell you from the tour that I did around my book, there were people that were using wireless or fixed wireless. There were people who were using uh, TV white space. You know, people were doing whatever took fiber to ensure that communities were actually served. And part of the challenge that we've had historically, Maggie, is that we have our programs primarily devoted just to fiber when it comes to funding. And that wholesale approach is just not working. That's why we had massive, not necessarily network failures, but just failures on the universal service side because we've not really funded a very diversified portfolio when it comes to how are we going to connect people. I think we also run the risk if we try to go back and retrofit networks, how long is that going to take, right? So now we're looking at adding more time. And I can tell you by 20, 25 years ago, I was trying to get access to dark fiber when I was in using community technology centers in cities. And I'm sure Keith can tell you the same thing, that there are also multiple uses of fiber in communities, which makes it also unrealistic because some of that fiber is already designated. So I think the key thing for this plan, if we're going to actually grow into how technology has actually evolved, we need to be thinking about the plethora of technologies, figure out what's the right solution for a particular community. I love, you know, I had the opportunity to be on NPR with Keith not too long ago. And I do love the stories of, of these independent guys who and women who are out there wiring communities of 500 people without government assistance. They're basically, as one guy told me in, in, in Kansas, in uh, 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 Kansas, he's wiring, he's leased everything except his wife to be able to bring access <laughs> to his folks on a Wi-Fi uh, a connection. And so I think, again, as the plan moves forward, let us not forget how far we actually have come with innovation. And let's start to think about what type of technologies work best for where people are situated. What may be a better solution to accomplish the top topographical challenges in rural? Where might there be a solution to a hybrid? But if we have a plan that becomes strictly, you know, co-located to a certain technology that's not technology agnostic, I think we're going to run into some of the same challenges that we've had with what Scott said, universal service. Maggie, I just want to say one more thing yeah. too that is really important on the rural piece, and I know you're going to jump into it, but I want to just respond quickly to Scott. I do want people to understand that when we talk about rural broadband and urban broadband, we're talking about American broadband problem. 
And so I do think it's important to understand that there are low income consumers that are affected. And I do think it's important that the way that money has been allocated in rural appears to have gone to communities predominantly white. But I want people to remember that there are people who live in the Black Belt of Mississippi and parts of Louisiana that do not have access. And so the question we should be saying is, who are the least, who are the ones among us that are least served? <laughs> and let's start there. And I think that shifts the conversation to how do we address maybe the competition issues that are affecting urban residents or affordability concerns, or how is that affecting the fact that we don't have, let alone running water in some places where people are extremely poor and not connected to resources that could actually boost their economic recovery. I, I agree. And, and we've also got, you know, people living um, in native lands too, you know, or right. native um, populations too that are very rural and, and unconnected. Yeah. So I'm just curious though, with this technology agnostic idea, what about sort of unproven technologies? <laughs> um, I think everybody knows who I'm talking about here. <laughs> the, the low orbiting satellite uh, technology that a lot of people, particularly the FCC really like to be promoting and, um, you know, Starlink got a lot of money from the the last reverse auction that went out um, allocating some FCC money. There are some critics who say that maybe that wasn't the best use of, of public funds uh, for them to be getting such a big chunk in, in some of these states. So I'm just curious what you guys think. I mean, was that is that the kind of events investments we should be making or should we um, because it, it really if you look at that, I mean, low orbiting satellite nothing's unconnected, right? Because satellite can go anywhere. So I, I'd like to start on that one, I guess. Um, you know, uh, generally speaking, we want to make sure that every technology can compete because if we, you know, if we had started a long time ago saying that no unproven technology could compete, we might be stuck with, um, you know, some early version of, of DSL uh, or, but, but so, but, um, but the diff, but the, the, the problem, the thing that may have happened in, in RDOF um, and we, you know, we won't, we don't know this really for a long time. Maybe we'll all be pleasantly surprised. Um, is that th that the rules seem to allow, uh, seem to make it so that you could bid in a way that the government or the, you know, the, the that the taxpayers were taking all the risk of the technology not working. Um, and so, if you know, if it doesn't, if if SpaceX, if it doesn't work out, um, if the other company can't can't provide it, uh, they don't really lose that much. Uh, they could have been done differently, and if, so for for example, you could have you could do it in a way that um, you know they only get they 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 get uh, the, the 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 money that they bid for in you know as they meet certain goals, uh, and with a guaranteed payout from the government, they would they'd be able to raise money in the capital markets that because they would have, the banks would know that they could pay it back, and so you know that would be a way of putting the risk on them, and so if they couldn't do it, um, then. Uh, you, you, you sort of you know ways to reverse reverse the risk. So you want to get them to participate, but you want to find ways that to make sure that they really believe in their technology. Um, that's I think one of, would be one of the best ways to do it because now they could they could bid for it with really no risk to themselves. Right, and I just want to back up for a second and just explain a little bit when we're talking about RDOF, because we like, I know we're in telecom world, we like to <laughs> say a lot of acronyms. Right. So that that was a, a mechanism of reverse auction, right? The Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, right? That um, the FCC had a pot of money that they were trying to allocate to different providers to build out infrastructure in rural areas. And they used this idea of a reverse auction. And Scott, I know you've done a lot of work on reverse auctions. Is that a good way to allocate this money? Because I think that kind of falls into our conversation too, because we're going to be potentially giving away a lot of federal dollars here. And it's a, it's a great well? way to, it's a great way to give away money. Um, it's, uh, you know, for the ones we've done so far, we've seen the, the, the results, the, the outcomes are much more cost effective than any other approach would be. Um, and it's been done in other countries for decades. And we were not the first ones to do this. Um, if it turns out that this most recent one uh, didn't work so well. I mean, that's an example of why the details of auctions matter so much, as we know from you know, the, the economists who won a Nobel, Nobel Prize this year on auctions. And it was for a, a lot of the work they did had to do with spectrum auctions. And people don't necessarily remember it again, unless they're in the telecom world. Um, but a lot of the early spectrum auctions had problems too. And you know, it took a while to get to work to, to figure out all of the details. 
Um, but as we know, those auctions have brought tremendous benefits um, to the world. Uh, and so I, I think it's important to continue with these reverse auctions. If there was, if something did go wrong with Ardoff, the key is to figure out what. Um, and like I said, maybe it'll turn out that everything will go so well, you know, the whole, the whole country will be covered by, um, by low, by Leo, sat, by low, low earth orbit satellites. Um, but it's the, but the details matter a lot. We have to pay attention to them. And, and, and Maggie, uh, I want Keith to jump in because he's more of an artifact, but, but I do want to let people know that satellite as one of the promising technologies also has other technical concerns that we still have to deal with, right? There are certain places satellite cannot be deployed. Um, there's certain interference challenges. And I think the key thing is, again, creating an ecosystem where you can have some of these unproven technologies be applied in particular pilots or areas to see what the return is on investment. I really want to caution people just to think like, let's just throw every post note at the digital divide. I mean, we're not serving anybody if we're still not meeting some mandatory thresholds, I think, of affordability of satellite uh, or consistency and resiliency of those networks or the extent to which, you know, a windstorm comes through and you can't get anything, not even, you know, because as we know with satellite in rural areas, and keep correct me, I'm wrong, we see a lot of that just for uh, cable television potentially, but not necessarily where this intersection of a variety of technologies are playing off of that same network. So that comes with my experience with it, but I'll be quiet and, and let Keith jump into the art off. Yeah. But I think those so, are important considerations. Yeah, Keith, I mean, did the the Ardoff reverse auction, did that work well for you guys? I mean, you were a participant. We were a participant. We were awarded uh, some areas, several counties that surround us have pretty much still DSL on you know, copper and they're desperate for a better broadband. And we're trying to edge out into some of those communities and trying to figure out a way to make a business case. And, and Ardoff was one of the ways that we're trying to trying to do that with. We, we also using USDA with the Reconnect program and some Community Connect grants, any any source of funding we can get to help make a business case for an area that's just five six customers per mile that makes it difficult to build to build fiber to. Yeah. Okay. So um, I also want to get back to the plan here a little bit. You know, there was also some mention of um, prioritizing municipal uh, networks, so cities and um, and other sort of nonprofits, I guess, uh, that would potentially be in a community and building out broadband. And this has proven to be pretty controversial among the uh, carriers, you know, the, the big guys like Comcast and Verizon and AT&T, they've all spoken out that they feel like that's a really bad idea. Um, and some might argue because they don't like anybody competing with them. <laughs> but Keith, since we have you and, and you're a smaller competitor, I mean, what are your thoughts on you know, if the government is going to be allocating all these big, you know, buckets of money, should they be giving a preference to um, to city governments and other sort of nonprofit cooperatives? That is a difficult question. And uh, and I will say that our largest city is 700 people, so they're not going to be building a network, I don't think, uh, a municipal network. But we are uh, competing against other companies as we branch out. And, and, and uh, I, I totally get that but when you know one of the thing about when these some of these big companies are doing a, a poor job and still trying to serve people with copper for broadband you know you can understand why people are looking for alternatives better broadband providers and uh so it's it's tough as a provider it's a tough question to answer uh because obviously you know we don't skip some pities competing against but if we're doing a poor enough job that we're not getting a job done i can certainly see see why that's a popular topic and why why it's going to be more prevalent. Yeah, Nicole, I don't know, do you want to, what do you think of the idea of uh, government funds going to fund um, city-owned networks? Well, you know, I have a really interesting opinion about this because I've been in this game for like 20 plus years. I know I don't look that old and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I've been in it for a very long time. You know, and I was around- You were in elementary like, school, come I on. Was. I, was. <laughs> I would love to say that I was, but you know. You know, the thing is, I mean, with municipal broadband, let me just be real clear about it. I mean, first and foremost, it is a very tough business model, particularly if the government is not an anchor to that network. And I don't care what people say. I have seen it the last 15, 20 years where, you know, sitting in the city of Chicago, actually debating one of the first municipal networks, there was a challenge of having the city migrate all their services to make the network profitable. 
which is why, again, I think what we find ourselves in this infrastructure plan kind of going down the same rat holes. And what I would actually suggest, what I love about Keith's model, for example, some of these people that are out here trying to provide broadband service are also trying to make money. Whether it's an incumbent provider or it's a small nonprofit collaborative or it's an electrical provider, the key thing is we have to stop being so constrained when it comes to the way that we're trying to get access to everybody. I think if you go down the trap of municipal broadband, yes, you want to make some clearings. There were lots of schools. I'll give you a great example that were trying to build mesh networks and came back to me and said, wait a minute. We can't do this because we heard that there are municipal broadband network rules. But what those schools were actually trying to do were not in violation of municipal broadband. They were trying to figure out how to navigate a system that had so many constraints that when we got to this place where schools needed to find ways to invest in mesh networks or churches wanted to run their own networks, that's a different conversation. And I think that's where we have to look at this infrastructure plan and think about we can go down municipal broadband networks, particularly in areas where we know there's not going to be a provider where the city or the uh, local government has proven a business case that they are going to be the provider, they're going to be the troubleshooter, they're going to make sure they have mass the type, right revenue for the types of updates. But at the same time, and I'm not in no way suggesting any big company does it better, I think we also need to be realistic that the ecosystem is large and wide, and it's large and wide enough for us to figure out how people like Keith do not have to go to seven different agencies to fund a network that where he's serving people who are five to seven folks within a square mile. And I think that's a different conversation, Maggie, that I feel like oftentimes when I look at the infrastructure bill and I'm sort of reflecting on what is the next step, I'm thinking, are we still trying to regurgitate some of the old policies that we know for a fact put us back into sort of a dogma where we couldn't get things done? And when we do right. that, we're not servicing the country by keeping people connected. We're basically yeah. going back to old conversations without progressively moving forward on what have we learned so far that can work. Where are we not connected? I'll be honest, that actually starts with the lack of a broadband map, <laughs> which we probably yeah. desperately need first before we even talk about any of this stuff. Because right. without that, we're again going to go back to old models and practices and back to places that may be overcapitalized, underbuilt or overbuilt without really understanding what we're trying to solve. Right. I've been working and on I that broadband map for about, what, 10 or 15 years? Now. I yeah. know. That's I was right. a teenager, Keith, a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the other thing, too, is, you know, we talk about this money that could be coming from this plan, right, from the, the infrastructure legislation that we are expecting to come out. But then there's also the ongoing funding, which happens, um, you know, is particularly hard for a lot of these rural networks. And that's where, you know, the FCC comes in with its universal service fund. And I just want to touch on this really quick before we sort of move on to, to getting away from talking about strictly rural and get into some of these other issues. But um, FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr came out with an idea um, last week about uh, how to keep the Universal Service Fund alive. And, and for those of you who don't really know what that is, this is a fund that actually the, the telephone providers pay into, and it's based upon revenue that they get from uh, long distance and international phone calling, which as we all know, I mean, who, who calls long distance anymore, right? So that's been going down and down and um, the contribution factor as a result is, is going up. And he's saying uh, he wants big tech companies to pay for that. And I would love to hear some thoughts on that. Nicole, you well, know. Actually, if, if I could, before yeah, we, just sure. before we move on too, too, uh, too far from this on, um, on municipal broadband, I just wanted to add one thing quickly. Okay, sure. Um, you know, I think an important question to ask is what is the objective that people are going for? Um, I mean, if it's to help low income people uh, get online and there's already service, is that is it? Is are you more likely to achieve that objective by building an entirely new, net, new network rather than subsidizing those low income people? Um, and the second is that uh, with um, you know a lot of municipal networks often run through cross subsidies. And so if they're going to be, if they're going to be, you know, by taking money from other parts of the budget, and they're often not transparent at all. A colleague of mine, Sarah O, oh, did a paper on um, municipal networks, and it was not specifically on this topic, but what she found was that only about a third of, of all muni networks even bothered reporting data to the FCC under their what they call form 477, even though they're required to. So somehow there's this myth that that these um, networks, some of them might be great, I'm not, not criticizing a particular network, but um, that they must be all goodness and light. And in fact, they are operating without giving us any information. So it seems odd to want to promote that uh, without without sort of knowing the details behind it. So, sorry, I just right. uh, yeah, wanted to, no, wanted to no, wait a little bit. That was a great point yeah. to make. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
Well, why don't you keep us, what do you think about um, about Commissioner Carr's proposal? Oh, right, the, the original, your, your actual question, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, so you, you, Universal Service has been, um, the Universal Service Fund has been a big problem. Almost every a report by the GAO or the Congressional Research Service and academics has found that the rural program now called Connect the Connected America Fund had zero impact on build out. Um, so that's that's one thing. It's been very, it's been extremely ineffective. Uh, then the other thing is that it's becoming relatively more expensive to um, to, uh, to to keep to keep going. Like as you said, the contribution factor is going up, and it's a tax that you you ask who calls long distance now. The answer is poor people and immigrants. Um, you know, people use calling cards, and so it's an extremely regressive tax uh, to keep this program going. So, you know, one thing we need to do is make the program more efficient, and there are some moves towards that, but still, mostly, if you once you're in the program, you get money forever, and they have private planes, and I mean, I, that's an exaggeration for lots of the companies, but it's not for all of them. Um, and uh, so we need we need work on that. And the current rules uh, on the Universal Service Fund prevent the FCC from collecting less than four and a half billion dollars a year, even if they don't give out four and a half billion dollars a year. So you know that would be a nice reform, not to collect more money than they say that they even need. Now, where the money should come from, um, we we you know, we want a tax that will have uh, that somehow fits in with uh, that at least is not regressive, that or if it's progressive. Um, ideally, it should come from uh, from tax revenues, uh, the way um, the way that most subsidies do, rather than a tax on the service it's subsidizing, which is also kind of a weird a weird thing. Um, the the tech companies. It seems to me that the the, you know, the, the rationale for going for for going after the tech companies is that they have money, um, mm -hmm. and maybe that's enough of a rationale for some people. But uh, you know, I'm. I'm I'm not sure uh, about this. I have mixed feelings because yeah, they do have money, um, and but on the other hand, they do also pay for access. They maintain networks too. Maybe not the last mile. Right. Um, so I, I don't think it's a simple question. Yeah, I don't know, Nicole. Do you have some thoughts? You know, should uh, we make Google pay? <laughs> you know, listen. I, I'm going to tell you that from people have heard me say this. I think you know, Commissioner Carr actually read my stuff. That's why he started talking about it. Here's the deal. I mean, what happened with the pandemic was quite disturbing, right? We had this sense, and uh, Larry Irvin has called it digital poverty, I've called it digitally invisible, where again, this binary digital divide became much more apparent to us. And as a result of that, we actually didn't know what to do as a nation. And we have, as Scott has mentioned, a universal service program that was always designed in communications to allow for eligibility among our low-income consumers or those who are elderly, et cetera. In that, for those of you who are watching this and are not aware of how it works, there's always the deployment money or infrastructure money that is primary channel to rural communities or rural telehealth. Then there's money that addresses affordability through the Lifeline program. Here's the challenge. When 50 million school-age kids go home because they no longer could be within the classroom and we find out that 15 to 60 million of them did not have a device nor internet access at home and 9 million of them that didn't have either were black and brown kids or kids from tribal lands, we failed because guess what? Schools had to beg, borrow and steal away from the stimulus to be able to get money to provide the universal service and access that was needed for our children to do distance learning. And we saw this play out in telehealth and work and other venues, which I think is really important for us to go back and reevaluate, do we have enough universal service to give? What we found out during this pandemic as well is not only were the telecom companies maintaining networks, but our tech companies were providing our groceries, providing our social networks, allowing us to speak with our you know, friends and family and doctors and communicate with civic partners. I mean, I'm a PTA vice chair. We did all of our meetings via these platforms. And you have to ask yourself on the universal service that was historically rooted in old telecom services in a new 21st century economy, do we have enough money? Will we have enough money to ensure that we'll never be in this place again? And that goes back to Scott. I, I do think it's high time to go back and revisit this. Is the money readily available because it's on a reimbursement basis? Are we putting it only in areas where you know we might want to diversify the portfolio? As I said earlier, be more technology agnostic. Do we need to think about whether or not the contribution factor in and of itself is enough in an environment where, as Scott sort of mentioned, we don't have as many companies that are providing phone services? So what are we tapping into and how does that pass to the consumer? 
So I do, and I have said this, and I and and you know I say it from a perspective of two ways. One, we either have to have the political good uh, political will to look at broadband as a service vulnerability, the same way we look at food and housing and other areas, and we put it on the national treasury and we treat it as a social support program, much like we're doing with EBB right now, which has gotten over one million people subscribed to it. Or we got to bring in new players. And the logical players who make billions of dollars in advertising revenue with tech companies, who with one cut of a check could actually broaden the scope of the of the fund, but also help us serve more people. So yeah. again, I think you know this goes back to having this conversation. This down payment and infrastructure is only going to go so far. And what's going to happen, Maggie and Scott and Keith, and tell me if I'm wrong, we're going to see these fractures and leakages and outdated functions in our sustainability programs have us go back when this other money runs out, because that's what people are doing right now, right? The stimulus money is running out for thousands of schools. The thing I'm Those worried about, though, is that um, uh -huh. the thing I worry about is that we end up thinking that there are certain uh, certain groups should pay for certain types of subsidies. Right. And we'll always end up in that. You know, then, then, you know, things will change and there won't be enough in that pot. Um, as opposed to, we don't decide that certain groups are responsible for certain other people. We're sort of, as a society, supposed to be responsible for everybody. Um, and, and that's sort of why, ideally, it would go through the, the, the broader tax system, right? Um, and now, I, whether there's a whether there's actually a, a political um, will for that, that's a different question. But we don't have a, a one set way in this country of doing it, which is kind of a problem, right? Like roads are, are, are maintained through um, gasoline taxes, mostly. Um, but, you know, uh, Nicole mentioned... Um, uh, food, um, snap. It's, it's we don't we don't you know we don't charge craft um, to to pay for that. That comes from you know comes from uh, rural taxes. So it's hard for us to figure out because we don't have one yeah. way of doing it in this country. Yeah, I want to, and this is a great way to sort of move into the next sort of portion that I want to make sure we have some time to talk about. And before we do that, though, I want to remind the audience that, you know, please submit your questions. We're going to try to leave some time um, here at the end to talk, and you can submit those at events at brookings.edu or on Twitter at uh, hashtag digital divide. So let's go into this next uh, little area that we should talk about here, because the plan isn't going to just cover like building out infrastructure. You know, another big area uh, of discussion in public policy here is really around affordability. And um, that's something that I feel like has been ignored uh, for a number of years or not really addressed. And, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about that. I guess, you know, one of my big questions is like, first, what does it mean when we're talking about making broadband affordable like who is it affordable for who should it be affordable for and and what should the policy you know should it be affordable for me uh you know maggie reardon or or is it you know affordable for somebody who um you know maybe doesn't have a job and and really uh is living below the poverty level so what what are we talking about here who wants to go first i don't know if, if keith um if you want to talk about like in particularly in in Kentucky, in, in the area that you, you serve? I yeah, mean, we're, I can, what does affordability look like for your constituents? Well, actually, I, I serve uh, my areas, two of the poorest counties in the country, actually, and we have uh, a lot of poverty here, but but the ironically, the Universal Service Fund that we were just talking about helps us be able to keep our rates, uh, reasonable rates, uh, comparable to urban areas. And then, of course, the affordability is part of USF, the, uh, the lifeline part. And, you know, of course, the EBB program has started and we don't know how long it's going to last, but uh, I know we've had over 200 people apply for the EBB program just in the last couple of weeks. And, uh, and, and I'm, you know, it's, it's a little bit difficult to, trying to get uh, everything straight as to how do you actually apply and, and USAC is and Yeah, is it's interesting and, though, but, Keith, you mentioned that um, just like we were talking about the Universal Service Fund. So getting that subsidy from the federal government to help with operations actually helps you be able to keep the cost down of your service too. That's interesting. Absolutely. That's yeah. a big part of what the USF is for. Uh, and, and it's, you know, allowed us to be able to keep our rates. You know, I think we charge under 40, but $39 for a hundred meg up and down and, and we, we gig a gig for under, under a hundred. And we, and, and our people, you know, we're getting a high percentage of our people take our broadband because it's becoming more and more of a utility now. It's like water and electricity. You almost have to have it 
no matter what your income. Yeah. And, you know, and, and just to sort of, again, explain to folks who are dropping in and, and watching this, when we talk about, um, you know, subsidies on the consumer side, we, again, Universal Service Fund is also funding the Lifeline program, which provides a $9.25 um, subsidy for low-income people who qualify that they can spend on either uh, telephone service or broadband. Um, and then, since the pandemic, uh, Congress also allocated funds for the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, uh, which Nicole mentioned, and that provides a $50 subsidy to um, for internet service. And um, I mean, how's that going? A, a million people have signed up, more than a million people. I, I think people think that that's a lot of people heralded that is like, oh, this is great. We really needed the subsidy, but how's it going? I mean, are there concerns? Like, is that how we make broadband affordable for everyone? I don't well, know. Maybe, maybe Scott, I, then I'll go I take, yeah. um, Okay, so, go ahead, Scott. I mean, I mean your, your first, the, the, the way you set up the question also is really interesting because, you know, do we have an affordability problem? But it's, it's a problem defining affordability. Um, we don't, you know, that doesn't have a specific definition. And there's been a lot of work on that question overall. Molly Orshinsky, an economist um, who came up with basically our poverty, what we consider poverty lines in the 1960s, um, kind of built this whole field of how do we how do we think about that question? Because it depends on how much people value different different things, um, and then also prices. So it's it's hard to so it's it's hard to define what that even means. Um, but then going to the EBP uh, and what people uh, and 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 how you might help people. A voucher-like program is definitely the right way to go. You let people make decisions on what they're going to spend their money on. Um, so the best thing would be to give them money and let them decide to spend what, what, what to spend their money on, but we don't do that. Um, and so, you know, the next best thing would be some kind of voucher program. Uh, the problem the problem with the emergency broadband benefit program as it was set up, well, there are two. One is that if you look in the law, it has no objective. It doesn't say what it's for. So how are we supposed to measure whether it's done a good job when we don't know what it's for? Was it to get more people online? Was it to help people who are having trouble paying their bills? Um, was it to let um, the ISPs uh, bring everyone up to a $50 a month plan since um, you know the household is gonna be charged zero no matter what the price of their plan was up to $50? Uh, and so it's, it's hard to say. I mean, anybody who's eligible for it should definitely sign up for it. Um, but we could do better with a plan like that going forward if we were to you know, put more thought into how it should be designed, um, because we can, we, it, could be, it could be done in a way um, that does not uh, create incentives for ISPs to bump up the plans that people are, are on. And I think that um, that's something that people have been complaining about, right? That's that's come out in some of the reporting that I've seen is that um, Verizon has been accused of uh, sort of bumping people up to a more expensive plan uh, and that's covered under EBB. And yeah, then it's what was 100% predictable. Um, right. In fact, many of us predicted it <laughs> because I mean, if you're in the pricing department of, of, of an ISP anywhere, why wouldn't you? Um, it, it, but it didn't have to be like that. The program could be designed, a program could be designed to make it, very difficult for a company to do it. And I don't mean via rules or laws because those are easy to easy to gain. But for example, if you could design a voucher so that um, the company doesn't know that you're paying with a voucher, then you can't identify the people who are using it. And it reduces uh, the incentive to get rid of the low cost plans. So there are things we could do to really improve this in the future if we if we go forward with it. Right. Yeah, and what are your thoughts, Nicole? Yeah, I mean, I think it's such an interesting conversation we're having about the emergency broadband benefit because I sort of look at it a different way. I mean, first and foremost, you can go back and have this conversation that maybe there was, you know, some type of price changing because of the benefit being available. But then you look at Keith where his folks are paying thirty nine dollars and they have a fifty dollar benefit to put towards that. I think, again, we find ourselves going down the telecom trap, which is sort of seeing everything so myopic when really Think Scott, the thing that you said that I can't agree with is the fact that we actually saw Lifeline 2.0 in this emergency broadband benefit. The $9.25 is obviously not enough money in universal service for people to actually get the service whatsoever. The fact that we have had 40% uptake on Lifeline and we saw a million people come on this. And I'm going to be honest, I saw the EBB marketed in my county school district. I have seen it in commercials. I have seen it among community-based organizations. And I think that speaks volumes to the fact that when we look at what Biden is trying to do with the broadband infrastructure plan, and I hope somebody from the White House is listening, 
We're not talking about making this a telecom issue. We're really talking about how do we integrate this type of universal service where it's interagency and it's also driven by our social service providers in partnership with our private sector. And I agree with you, Scott. We've got to think about what this looks like. But clearly, when people are choosing between broadband and bread, and the EBB is really clear, are you on free and reduced price lunch? Are you a person who was uh, unemployed or dislocated during the pandemic? Those folks, and, and as, as Keith said, are you in an area where the poverty line is so high that you have to continuously make decisions based on data that we already know that costs, though not as high as other uh, areas of relevancy, there's still grandmothers that make less than a dollar and on uh, 50 cents on a dollar that are getting their kids connection to broadband because they want them to be successful in school and break the trajectory of poverty. But I do think, Scott, to your point, I do think it's important for us to look at, again, what we've learned in this pilot and how do we take those lessons and modernize the Lifeline program so we can actually see yeah. what value that brings to get more and people. You're also making, another, you know, you're saying again, a point you made earlier, which is that, you know, we have to decide what kind of program is this? Is, is it supposed to be like a right. welfare program? And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. Right. I mean, it should be is a social it, service it assistance program, right. Or, or right. is it specifically for broadband? Um, right. and, but, and those have kind of different implications. But, but it does, but, I'm sorry, Maggie, you know, there's one thing on Scott's okay. point. But it does indicate, Scott, that if it's, and I, I'm glad that you like wrote it and backtrack on the welfare program. It's not about <laughs> a welfare program. It's whether or not the FCC as an agency by itself could actually deliver that benefit to the people that yeah, need it fair. most. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that for me as a researcher, I've learned tremendously, even in the writing of the book, that here is a program that had a million plus people take it up in a very short period of time because it was disseminated through a variety of entities, something that many of us who are watching this right. have been advocating but, for years. But, but let's, do a little, let's do a little experiment question right here, a little data gathering. Keith, how many of the people um, who signed up for EBBP um, are new subscribers? Uh, there are a few. We're of the uh, probably about um, yeah, maybe 10% of the 200. 10%. Okay, so so we did get some. I wondered uh -huh. about that myself. Would it just be people getting a discount, or would it be new? And we've got right. Some of those. And so that's that's one of the inherent problems. What is it we're going for? Is this to help poor people, um, or is it um, to get a, to to encourage adoption? Because those have you know kind of different implications of what we you know how we want to proceed. But you could possibly be doing both in a well, sense. We, yeah, we are. You could I mean, be doing yeah. both. But, but one yeah, thing I question yeah. though. But one thing I question though is mm -hmm. fifty dollars, right? To me, that seems like you're you're also artificially if you keep that as permanent, right? right like right. that could artificially inflate the price of broadband because we are seeing providers, most major ones, are offering a ten dollar or fifteen dollar low cost option. Lifeline would cover that as it stands today. So why do we, you know, do we need um, a higher subsidy? And you know, like for example, Keith, not to pick on you, but you know, you've got a thirty nine dollar <laughs> plan, right? Would there be an incentive for you to bump that up to fifty dollars if you've got, um, you know, a a subsidy that people are going to get? I mean, why not get another ten bucks from the government? Keith has the disadvantage of being the only one of us who actually does something. Right. So. We don't. <laughs> we don't operate that way. A small communication provider or a cooperative. We just these are our neighbors and friends. And we're not looking. But if you were just to maximize profits, it's more than that. We're trying right. to keep make people's lives better here. That's part of our part of our mission. That's right. And, and Maggie, if I could add to that, I think, you know, and again, in writing the book, and it's coming soon, folks, it's coming soon, I promise. The, the issue is, the manuscript is almost done. Uh, if Daryl West is watching, it's coming to you, it's coming to you. But this, <laughs> this, this is the issue, which I think is so important about this conversation. When we start talking about infrastructure, we start talking about broadband, we immediately go to, uh, you know, deployment, we immediately go to, well, poor people got to get online, so how are they going to get online? Let me tell you, folks, the train has left the station. This is no longer binary who's online and who's not online. We're talking about basic functions of learning, working, telehealth, and others that are bandwidth stopping applications that also require people to have a device alongside. We talk about that with the EBB in terms of people getting a device. And I think it's important for us to start to think about how do we create an internet for all and for all intents and purposes where we're not necessarily starting to bifurcate out the internet in ways that we're trying to provide people with a handout. It is a true fact that people before the pandemic were on the wrong side of digital opportunity. Black, brown, low income, elderly, tribal, and that's a fact born, born. And guess what? We have found that the, the more and more we allow those folks to be digitally invisible, 
the more and more we're going to pay the cost in other ways. So I do think it's important to, to, to both Keith and Scott, let's document what we're seeing. The, the biggest failure of this whole pandemic and digital access is we have no life lessons of what happened with schools, of what happened in telehealth, what happened with all of these national experiments. We've been placing post-it notes on the wall. And that's why, again, I put out there a framework of a tech new deal because we're only talking about the adoption side. What about digital literacy? What about workforce development opportunities that come from this? What about making churches and libraries that were digital parking lots into digital anchor institutions that can help? And I think one of the nice things that we haven't talked about that I do like in the Clyburn and the Klobuchar bill is the, uh, is the creation of an agency that would actually look at what you're talking about, Scott, which is to gather the data and listen to people like Keith and others to figure out what it is that they need and to do what Maggie's talking about and you're talking about, which is to collect the data so we ensure that we're not you know, creating predatory schemes or potentially not seeing some of these blind spots as we try to close the divide across the country. I, I mean, I can't, I can't agree with you more on, on, on that uh, because we, we've missed a huge opportunity during the pandemic to learn lots. You know, every school tried to do something to deal, you know, help kids who weren't connected. Um, you know, somebody should have been taking notes on what they were doing. What did each school do? Um, how many of those programs were successful? Uh, you know, and it could be, you know, there could have been short-term success. Like, did the kids attend classes? Long-term success, how did it affect their education? But no, nobody was interested. Nobody did it. The FCC didn't do it. The Department of Education didn't do it. Um, and, you know, think of what we would learn. There have been 10,000 experiments, but yeah. nope. And so that worries me a little bit that we still don't understand the importance of, 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 of gathering that kind of information. I'm going to move a little bit to some audience questions because I've gotten some here um, in my little chat window. And this goes to what we're talking about. What about, um, you know, David Weber asks, what about, uh, you know, defining broadband as a utility? And then you make it eligible for some other social service, like utility assistance programs, um, like assisted uh, housing rent, you know, using housing rent calculations. I mean, would that, you know, does that require Title II? Oh my gosh, the third rail. Or, you know, you know how, what would we do there? I, I think it's a great question. I mean, it goes back to the conversation we've been having. And thank you, Dave, for that question. I mean, there was no reason that public housing or for any federally assisted housing in this country didn't have broadband sort of baked into that, that we didn't create these super Wi-Fi hotspots that young people could actually tap into or, you know, community-based organizations were eligible to E-rate the same way other organizations were. It's interesting, though, and I, I, I like this question from the standpoint, as I've been talking about it in my own work, that there is something to be said about equating broadband to rural electricity, right, which is not as dynamic versus creating broadband to a utility, whereas we look at other utility services that have these social supports, right? So there's the low income housing assistance program that goes so you can make sure you can afford heat. There's something with water that's actually, you know, there's all these wraparound programs, much like what we're trying to do with the EBV. So I do think, you know, I know we're out of time and Maggie, we are hijacking your panel. <laughs> but I think that um, it's worth a conversation, which I think all of us are kind of saying, which is, if we know the direction that we try to go in this country, then how does that pair this down payment on infrastructure, universal service in terms of, you know, really reevaluating what we're trying to solve? And then how do we measure that so we can go back and say that this is very helpful? I'll and leave it at not, that. The other thing that I want to touch on too is it's not just about affordability too. That's not another barrier, right? Wow. There, you know, because, and I think someone else on this panel, I forgive me for forgetting who said it, but it, it wasn't, some of these programs, the, the ones that are, you know, free or very low cost, they still don't have amazing take rates, right? So why aren't people signing up for broadband, even when it's available, even when it's made to be more affordable? Like, what are the barriers and what can this legislation do to try to get those people online too? Because that's important. Well, I mean, partly it goes to um, doing ex experiments because if we have lots of different programs, we can see which ones are more effective at getting people online. Um, another thing is that, you know, still most of the data we're working with is from before the pandemic. And, you know, one thing that you know, when people say that um, broadband uh, or the internet's not relevant to them, um, probably for a lot of people realized that was no longer true uh, during the pandemic. And we, and, and while the FCC data and so on isn't, isn't really out yet uh, for most of the pandemic, I guess some is, uh, 
the um, you, you can look at uh, ISPs 10Ks and you can see an uptick in um, in subscribership during the pandemic. So you, you know, it, and and as more and more people sign as more people sign up, the group that's left gets to be harder and harder to get um, because those are the ones who, for various reasons. Um, I, Obviously, if they're the last ones to sign up and there are reasons for it. And so they're the hardest ones to get. And so the problem gets more and more challenging over time, even as you even as you're succeeding. I'm gonna yeah. let Keith go. Keith, I'm being good, okay? So you go. <laughs> well, I mean, it is, it is a difficult question because there are some people that just do not want the internet. We we have customers that just that have actually telephones with us that don't want the internet. I know that's hard to believe, but it's still there's still a few out there. And it's just going to take time for them to realize the relevance or uh, or whatever, because we all know most of us, it, it's one of the more important things in our life, bro, man, we can't hardly function without it. And it's hard to believe there's still people out there that that, that are functioning without it, but but there are some. And, and it's a smaller and smaller percentage, I think, as time goes by. I think time will take care of this if nothing else does, but there's probably probably other ways to resolve it quicker, but I'm, I'm not sure that I have those ideas. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I would say this. I mean, when I say that I've been in this 20 plus years, Peggy, I've been in this 20 plus years, starting with the community tech center movement, where we were just training people on basic computer functions like Microsoft Office to be able to get jobs. I mean, here's the deal. We have dealt with this digital divide as a binary constraint. And we now have an internet where it is actually so much more complicated and so much more layered. You cannot get a ride sharing service without a smartphone and a credit card. You cannot see a doctor, you know, without some form of either federally supported health insurance or your own private insurance and a smartphone and broadband. And so I think the more and more we see sort of see this push where you cannot function in the analog world, that this question of adoption and literacy, adoption is actually going to become a moot point. The problem will be is that we will continue to widen the, the systemic inequalities that already exist in this country. The people who are not online, that's for example, I'll just go back to the schools in terms of what Scott was asking in terms of data. We already know publicly that McKinsey study that says that black and brown and tribal land students are going to be behind months in terms of cognitive retention of learning principles simply because they could not log online to actually do school. With that being the case, it's just really important for us to sort of take this, assume that the train has left the station and work hard to get to local champions that are actually doing this work. I can tell you, and, you know, I feel so shameless because I'm not moderating and I know I work at Brookings, but it was a really nice treat to go to the people that are affected most by this. Uh, the people who are trying every day to figure out how to navigate this, whether they have one or two providers, they have no providers, they have zero G, they got 4G, they almost got 5G, they got a laptop, they don't. The bottom line is people know what they are without. And it's just incumbent on us, as we've experienced with this pandemic, to figure out ways to normalize this for our community. And you know what, that leads to another question we have from the audience, from Brian Kelly at the Education Commission of the States. How can state policymakers um, move to close the digital divide, um, especially in light of federal changes and all this federal money? How does, will, should this impact state education policy? Yeah. I don't know, what do you guys think about like state policymakers? Yeah, I mean, I'll say this and then I'll be quiet for the rest of the time, I promise. I personally think that state state officials need to take on with the federal government's Department of Education at the agencies, no child left offline. We did it with no child left behind. We need to do it with no child left offline. We know we have to equip our students for 21st century learning. I have a 14 year old. I did not like her being home for over 18 months. I really didn't because I was here and she was on her device, but she has learned so many skills that are going to be skills that she'll need for the 21st century. So I do think it's important for us to have something where states can actually take on this No Child Left Offline initiative and get resources to the schools that our kids are resourced. I think a lot. I think a lot of states are doing their own broadband yep. initiatives. Uh, I know Kentucky's just passed yep. a lot this year. They're going to start a program this year. A lot of states are doing that. And and I know in my two counties, all these kids had access to the internet, and all not all of them had it. That's right. Because uh, but a lot of them got it that didn't have it once the pandemic started, and uh, it was. It was about surrounding counties. They really, really struggled here in East Kentucky. Right. No child left offline. Okay, great. So we've uh, we're getting down here to the wire. Real quick, does anybody want to wrap up for us here? Uh, a little bit of, of your thoughts on on where do we go from here? Um, you know, Scott, you wanted. I know your big thing is we need to be able to measure this, right? Um, any last thoughts on where do we go? Um. <clears throat> 
Well, I, I guess uh, you, you gave my last thought pretty well. Uh, I, I, I want to make, I want to know, we, we need to know that what we're doing is making a difference um, because otherwise, you know, we could just spend money and say that the outcome is that we spent all this money. That's not the outcome we want. The outcome we want is that people are online and know how to use the internet and benefit from it. And so we need to know whether the programs we're, um, we're promoting are making that difference. And we need to build that in from the start. And I hope we do. Yeah. Keith, how about you? Last thoughts here to wrap up. Last thoughts are it's expensive to build good broadband and government assistance is needed. And, and from all what I hear, the government assistance is coming even more. And uh, we need to use it wisely and take full advantage of it. And hopefully small companies like mine will continue to branch out, edge out and, do, and, and cover areas that don't have it. Yeah. How about you, Nicole? I'm just going to say this. Read my book. It's coming out. It has everything in here. No, I'm kidding. Um, I just want to say <laughs> I can help it. No, I think I did all what everybody said. And Maggie, thank you for doing this, because I think at the end, we got to figure out how to close this divide for good. Yeah, well, I want to thank all of you. Um, this was a really great discussion. And I hope uh, I get invited back to um, to talk to some more really smart people about this issue. I I'm pretty passionate about it, too. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.